How Idolatry Crept Into Christianity Part 2 Idolatry, Part 3 of 5 Part 3, How an Effort by the Emperor of Constantinople, Leo III to Destroy Images Was Dampened Striking Parallels Between the Teachings of Christianity and Some Ancient Civilizations In 726 CE, a scant 19 years following the Council of Constantinople, the Emperor of Constantinople, Leo III, also known as Leo the Isaurian, but best known as Leo the Iconoclast, began to destroy images within the expanding circle of his influence. Thomas Hodgkin noted, It was the contact with Mohammedanism which opened the eyes of Leo and the men who stood around his throne, ecclesiastics as well as laymen, to the degrading and idolatrous superstitions that had crept into the church and were overlaying the life of a religion which, at its proclamation the purest and most spiritual, was fast becoming one of the most superstitious and materialistic that the world had ever seen. Shrinking at first from any representation whatever of visible objects, then allowing herself the use of beautiful and pathetic emblems, such as the Good Shepherd. In the 4th century the Christian Church sought to instruct the converts whom her victory under Constantine was bringing to her in myriads. By representations on the walls of the churches of the chief event of Scripture history. From this the transition to specially reverenced pictures of Christ, the Virgin and the Saints, was natural and easy. The crowning absurdity and blasphemy, the representation of the Almighty Maker of the universe as a bearded old man, floating in the sky, was not yet perpetrated. Nor was to be dared till the human race had taken several steps downward into the darkness of the Middle Ages. But enough had been already done to show whither the Church was tending. And to give point to the sarcasm of the followers of the Prophet when they hurled the epithet idolaters at the craven and servile populations of Egypt and Syria, Hodgkin, Thomas. Volume 6, Book 7 Page 431. The irony of Emperor Leo's transition from victor over the Saracens in Eastern Europe to Leo the Iconoclast is inescapable. After he defeated the Muslims, he adopted their drive to abolish idolatry. In any case, Pope Gregory II attempted to dampen Leo's enthusiasm with the following counsel. Are you ignorant that the popes are the bond of union, the mediators of peace between the East and West? The eyes of the nations are fixed on our humility, and they revere, as a god upon earth, the Apostle St. Peter, whose image you threaten to destroy. Abandon your rash and fail enterprise, reflect, tremble, and repent. If you persist, we are innocent of the blood that will be spilt in the contest, may it fall on your own head, Gibbon, Edward, E.S.Q. Volume 5, Chapter 49, Pages 376, 377. As George Bernard Shaw stated in the preface to his play, St. Joan, the churches must learn humility as well as teach it. Shaw, George Bernard. 1924, St. Joan. Preface. No doubt the person who shouts, look at how humble I am. Can't you tell I'm the most humble person you ever saw, is instantly disqualified. More to the point, the Pope who sanctioned images while at the same time stating, but for the statue of St. Peter himself, which all the kingdoms of the West esteem as a god on earth, the whole West would take a terrible revenge, Lab, P. Venice 1728, 1733. Sacrosancta Concilia. Volume 7, page 7. Should perceive an asteroid-sized theological inconsistency. Exactly who should reflect, tremble and repent should be boldly obvious. That Pope Gregory II and his followers were willing to wage war in defense of their images testifies to the extraordinarily high value, that is to say, the worth, the worthiness, i.e. the worship, they placed on these images. And spilled blood they did, to such an extent that the defeat of Leo's army at Ravenna turned the waters of the river Pered. So badly was the river polluted that during six years, the public prejudice abstained from the fish of the river. Gibbon, Edward, ESQ Volume. Five, Chapter Forty Nine, Page Three Seventy Nine. When the Synod of Constantinople convened in 754 CE, the Roman Catholic Church staged a boycott due to nonconformity of the Greek Church with Catholic teaching. Or at least, that was the excuse they offered. A more likely scenario, perhaps, was that the Catholics recognized their inability to defend a practice that was scripturally condemned by the Almighty God they claimed to worship. Nevertheless, the Synod of Constantinople convened without them and after a serious deliberation of six months the 338 bishops pronounced and subscribed a unanimous decree that all visible symbols of Christ, except in the Eucharist, were either blasphemous or heretical, that image worship was a corruption of Christianity and a renewal of paganism. 
that all such monuments of idolatry should be broken or erased, and that those who should refuse to deliver the objects of their private superstition, were guilty of disobedience to the authority of the Church and of the Emperor, Ibid, page 369. The fact that the Synod exempted the Eucharist from association with paganism is particularly curious to those knowledgeable of ancient Persian and Egyptian rites and rituals. The Persians employed consecrated water and bread in the ancient cult of Mithras, Bonwick, James, FRGS. 1956, Egyptian Belief and Modern Thought. Colorado, Falcons Wing Press. Page 417. S.T.W., Doan notes in his 1971 study, Bible Myths and Their Parallels in Other Religions. It is in the ancient religion of Persia, the religion of Mitra, the Mediator, the Redeemer and Savior, that we find the nearest resemblance to the sacrament of the Christians, and from which it was evidently borrowed. Those who were initiated into the mysteries of Mitra, or became members, took the sacrament of bread and wine. This food they called the Eucharist, of which no one was allowed to partake but the persons who believed that the things they taught were true, and who had been washed with the washing that is for the remission of sin. Tertullian, who flourished from 193 to 220 AD, also speaks of the Mithraic devotees celebrating the Eucharist. The Eucharist of the Lord and Savior, as the Magi called Mitra, the second person in their trinity, or their Eucharistic sacrifice, was always made exactly and in every respect the same as that of the Orthodox Christians, for both sometimes used water instead of wine, or a mixture of the two. Doan, Thomas W., 1971. Bible Myths and Their Parallels in Other Religions. New York, University Books. Pages 307, 308. The cult of Osiris, the ancient Egyptian god of life, death, and fertility, offered the same allure of an easy salvation as did Paul's concept of salvation through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. The secret of that popularity was that he, Osiris, had lived on earth as benefactor, died for man's good, and lived again as friend and judge. Bonwick, James. Page 162. The ancient Egyptians commemorated Osiris' birth with a cradle and lights and annually celebrated his alleged resurrection. They also commemorated his death by eating sacred bread that had been consecrated by their priests. They believed this consecration transmuted the bread to the veritable flesh of Osiris, Ibid, page 163. If it all sounds familiar, it should, for as James Bonwick comments, as it is recognized that the bread after sacerdotal rites becomes mystically the body of Christ. So the men of the Nile declared their bread after sacerdotal rites became mystically the body of Isis or Osiris, in such manner they ate their god. Ibid, page 417. Furthermore, as Bonwick writes, The cakes of Isis were, like the cakes of Osiris, of a round shape. They were placed upon the altar. Glidden writes that they were identical in shape with the consecrated cake of the Roman and Eastern churches. Melville assures us, the Egyptians marked this holy bread with St. Andrew's cross. The presence bread was broken before being distributed by the priests to the people, and was supposed to become the flesh and blood of the deity. The miracle was wrought by the hand of the officiating priest, who blessed the food, Ibid, pp. 417-418. In like fashion, ancient Buddhists offered a sacrament of bread and wine, Hindus a Eucharist of Soma juice, an intoxicating plant extract. In the ancient Greeks a sacrament of bread and wine in tribute to Demeter, a.k.a. Ceres, their goddess of corn, and Dionysus, a.k.a. Bacchus, their god of wine. In this manner, they ate the flesh and drank the blood of their gods, Doan, Thomas W., pp. 305, 309. Idolatry Part 4 of 5. Part 4, How Christianity Further Drenched Itself Into Creation Worship. The religious parallels are so obvious as to demand explanation. We can reasonably question how the cults of Isis and Osiris placed the mark of St. Andrew's cross on their consecrated bread 2,000 years before St. Andrew was born. Clairvoyance on the part of the Egyptians, or religious plagiarism on the part of St. Andrew. In addition, there are striking similarities between the mysteries of Pauline Christianity and those of the cults of Isis and Osiris, mysteries to include the virgin birth, Isis the virgin mother, Horus the child, and the atoning sacrifice of Osiris, followed by his resurrection and assumption of the role of Redeemer. Justin Martyr, the famous Christian apologist, dismissed these similarities by claiming that Satan copied the Christian ceremonies in order to mislead the remainder of mankind, Ibid, page 307. 
However, taking note of the time sequence, these earlier Eucharistic practices and mysteries of faith preceded those of Catholicism by more than 2,000 years. Considering this fact, T. W. Doan reasonably concluded. These facts show that the Eucharist is another piece of paganism adopted by the Christians. The story of Jesus and his disciples being at supper, where the Master did break bread, may be true, but the statement that he said, Do this in remembrance of me, this is my body. And this is my blood, was undoubtedly invented to give authority to the mystic ceremony, which had been borrowed from paganism, Ibid, page 312. Invented statements, in the Bible? How can that be, when all of the Gospels record Jesus' words at the Paschal meal? Well, all but one, that is. According to John 13 verse 1, Jesus was arrested before the Passover feast. So it's John against the synoptics. Or, to make the contest even, it's John against Q, abbreviation of the German word Kel, meaning source, the hypothesized common source document of the synoptic gospels. Lest anybody misunderstand, Catholics do not tolerate a symbolic interpretation of their sacramental rites. The Council of Trent, 1545, 63 CE, established laws concerning the alleged transubstantiation of the Eucharist, and these laws stand to this day. Not even the more liberal Second Vatican Council, 1962-65, effected a change. In short, the Council of Trent's judgment reads, Canon 1, if anyone denies that in the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist are contained truly, really, and substantially the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and consequently the whole Christ, but says that he is in it only as in a sign, or figure, or force, let him be anathema, Schroeder, Rev. Henry J., O.P. 1941, Canons and Decrees of the Council of Trent, Original Text with English Translation. London, B. Herder Book Company, page 79. In other words, anyone who considers the bread and wine of the Eucharist to be merely symbolic is to be anathema, i.e., cursed and excommunicated. This judgment is reinforced by the following. Canon 6, If anyone says that in the Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist, Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is not to be adored with the worship of Latria, Schroeder, Ref. Henry J., page 80, also outwardly manifested, and is consequently neither to be venerated with a special festive solemnity, nor to be solemnly borne about in procession according to the laudable and universal rite and custom of the Holy Church, or is not to be set publicly before the people to be adored and that the adorers thereof are idolaters, let him be anathema, latria, the worship or adoration owed to God alone. As opposed to Dulia, the honor given to the saints, and Hyperdulia, the honor given the Virgin Mary McBrien, Richard P. General Editor. 1995, HarperCollins Encyclopedia of Catholicism. New York, HarperCollins Publishers. In other words, those who refuse to adore, venerate, or glorify are to suffer the same fate as those who consider the Eucharist symbolic. These Catholic laws remain on the books to the present day. Which explains why so many Protestant denominations have sidestepped away from their Catholic cousins and either abolished or watered down their veneration of the Eucharist. This reaction is particularly easy to understand. For many pagan cultures taught assimilation of the qualities of the ancestral totem through eating bread transmuted into flesh. Which group has the real sacred saltine remains the subject of. Ongoing debate. Returning to the main subject, the Catholic Church responded to the Synod of Constantinople of 754 CE by calling a Second Council of Nicaea in 787 CE. This council reinstated image worship on the basis that the worship of images is agreeable to Scripture and reason, to the fathers and councils of the Church. Gibson, Edward, ESQ. Volume 5, Chapter 49, Page 397. Suddenly, the theory that certain 8th century clergy partook of hallucinogenic mushrooms begins to look pretty good. We have to wonder what apostolic fathers and which scripture this council consulted. For that matter, exactly how is this decision agreeable to scripture and reason? In any case, those religious communities that objected to Christian idol worship were cleansed by the Catholic armies. Beginning with the slaughter of Unitarian Christians in the mid-9th century, Empress Theodora gained the dubious distinction of being the one who restored the images to the Oriental, i.e. Eastern Orthodox, Church. Ibid, Volume. 6, Chapter 54, Page 242. All subsequent efforts to eradicate images in the Church were quashed, resulting in the idolatrous practices witnessed to this day. Of even greater concern is the adoption of human idols. Priest worship surfaced in the early 13th century, in the form of priests acting as intermediaries for confession and absolution of sins. Pope worship became manifest in the form of ritual kissing of the Pope's foot or ring. 
the creative doctrine of papal infallibility, as defined by Pope Pius IX at the First Vatican Council in 1869-1870, set the Pope as rival with God. The worship of Mary and the title Mother of God were canonized considerably earlier, at the Council of Ephesus in 431 CE. Directing prayers to saints, angels and the Virgin Mary was officially sanctioned from the early 7th century. The famous prayer to the Virgin Mary, Ave Maria, Hail Mary, lagged a thousand years behind, and received official formulation in the reformed breviary of Pope Pius V in 1568. However, among all the human subjects of worship, Jesus Christ is hands down the most worshipped mortal ever to have walked the earth.